All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be doing Getting Organized Using Technology in a Research Report. Our presenter will be Kelly Jo Bergheimer. Uh, just as a reminder, the session will be recorded, so if you need to come back later and watch it, it will be available. Uh, if you have any questions, please join the chat room. You can find a link for that in the bottom. The join chat room, go ahead and click on that. You can post any questions on that, and we will get to those at the end of the session. As well, there's in the bottom of the page, there's a downloadable resources where you can click and get the syllabus for this for the session. Uh, for now, we're going to turn the time over for Kelly. Time is yours. Thank you. It's so great to be here and welcome to Roots Tech 2023. Um, we're going to talk today about one of my favorite topics, getting organized. Um, and we're going to focus on using technology and a research report. But don't be concerned. It's not like writing a research report in high school. I think you'll really like it. So let's start with the reminders. No recordings and no photos allowed. And no audio and video recording of the classes either, just as a quick reminder. I do need to do some professional disclosures because I do work as a professional genealogist. Um, I'm a DNA editor at Legacy Tree Genealogists. That's a company that uh, specializes in researching. And then also I'm a contributor at Your DNA Guide, Diane Southard's group. And so if you're familiar with either one of those, um, those are my professional disclosures. So let's talk about a research report. So many years ago at a conference far, far away, I was in Indiana for the Federation of Genealogical Society conference many years ago. And um, it was held in Fort Wayne at the Allen County Library and the Conference Center in Fort Wayne. And it was towards the end of the day, and there was a session about writing research reports by Judy Russell. And some of you might have be familiar with Judy Russell, the legal genealogist, but I'm going to credit her with focusing me on using a research report for my genealogy. And I attended her session, and I thought, now, what am I going to learn about a research report? Do I really want to know anything about research reports? You know how sometimes you just end up in a session and you're not sure why? I'm so glad that I did. So thank you, Judy, for teaching this session, and I learned so much from you. So we're going to update and talk a little bit more about how I use research reports and how you might want to think about using research reports for what you're doing in genealogy as well. So what is a research report? It's an organized, methodical place to keep track of your research question or your project. So we're going to talk about research questions and what those look like. And some of us do a lot of different projects for our own research. We're looking for maybe a third great grandfather, or we're looking for someone's immigration. When did they come to America? Or when did they leave a certain country and go to another country? Or what was someone's military service? All kinds of research questions. And it's centered around a research question. So if you think of a research report as just centered around one question, that's going to help you today to focus on how you can make the most of this format. So you can really up your genealogy game by using a research report. There are lots and lots of reasons to do this. Organizing is going to make you more efficient. It's also going to help you not retread where you've already tread before. I mean, how many of us get so excited because we find this and we find that and we find that. And pretty soon we've uncovered two or three documents we already found in 2019 and we just forgot we had. So a research report can really keep you focused. And we will spend some time today talking about specifically DNA research reports because those are are so ever-changing because the records, our DNA match lists, our ethnicity reports are always updating and changing. And so a research report's a great way to keep track of all of that changing data. So what's your research question? So I listed a few samples here. And normally when I'm in person, we talk about what is your question? What is your question? But since we're a virtual audience today, I just listed a few questions here to give you an idea. So here's one research question. Where and when 
was Elmer Ellsworth Calderwood. And I've got some details there, born in Dark County in Greenville, Ohio, married to Ida Mae Gilbert, born in Greenville, Dark County, Ohio. Where and when was he? Where did he live? Where was he married? This kind of thing. So this is the, a sample of a research question. So if I know where he was when he was born, and I know where his wife was when she was born, can I find a marriage record? What kind of things do I need to know about for Dark County, Ohio? What about who are the parents and siblings of John Robeson, born in 1617 in Scotland? That's going to take me some time probably, right? Because that's pretty far back. But those are the kinds of things that you can focus on in a research question. Who's the biological father of Eugene Kennedy, born in 1931 in Pennsylvania, with a birth certificate recording him as a bastard? So that is uh, an unfortunate piece of history um, that there were people born in the early 1900s in America, and in some states, they're recorded as bastards. And so if we're looking for that biological father, that can be our research question. How about extend all the family lines of my third great grandmother, Deborah Barger, wife of Armstead Claspie and mother of Anne Claspie Offenbecker from Champaign County, Ohio. So these are the kinds of things that can be a research question that's the focus of a research report. And then as you answer questions, you start a new question. So you can probably just take a minute and think of 10 different research questions that you have, right? So you would start a research report for each one of those. And then that's where you start documenting what you found, what you know, and we'll go through that process today. So it's really important to take some thinking time. I think it's highly underrated, but thinking time really can save you more time in the long run. It's important to pause and think as you're planning, as you're looking for documents, as you're searching, but it's also important to be agile because we don't want to be afraid to go down a trail and then revise what we're doing and go another direction. And that's particularly important with DNA analysis. Sometimes we come to our research question with what we think is an answer already. And sometimes that confirmation bias or that think that we know the answer leads us a little bit astray. So we want to set that aside. We want to think of this more as a science endeavor, as an uncovering, discovering, and questioning endeavor. And so thinking time is really important. And of course, analysis is important. We want to pause long enough to analyze DNA testing. We want to read documents. We want to pull all the pertinent facts from those documents, not just keep accumulating them without researching them and looking at them and analyzing them. We've got all kinds of record collections to analyze that we might use to solve the problem. The research report is an excellent format you can use to organize all of that. So there are benefits, and some of these I've already mentioned, but it's a roadmap for what you wanted to know and what you learned, sort of like a travel log, if you're familiar with that format. It contains sources, citations, maybe screenshots of important documents, appendices, all in one location. That makes it easy to share easy to return to when you have time to work on it again, and you kind of have that summary of where you left off, you can track everything. And it's really an amazing tool that'll allow you to do a certain amount of research. And then maybe you have to wait for a record to be located or for a new collection to be added online or that new DNA match to appear. So whatever it is that you're pausing and waiting for, you're ready to go when that information comes in. So it's a great way to keep track of everything. So this is what I put in a research report. Of course, anytime you watch a presentation and someone gives you their ideas, you can make it your own. That's the great thing about it. You can look at what I track and what I put in a research report, but you can do whatever you want to do in a research report. Now, this is a standardized kind of thing that I do for traditional research, but I also have some other things that I include in DNA when we get to that a little bit later today.
So I usually have the surnames involved. I put myself as the researcher and the date that I started. Why would I do that? Well, because I want this to be something that someone else can look at in the future, pick up the mantle and continue on. The point of all of our accumulation and learning is not just to hoard it, right? We want to make sure that someone else later on can pick that up and take it from there. And I have a perfect example of that in my family. My grandmother's two sisters did lots of research. Both of them um, were, one was married and widowed and one never married. And they traveled and they went to archives, even archives outside the United States, but they were doing this kind of report format and tracking where they were and travel log kind of format for many, many years. And I was easily able to figure out where was the archive they were when they found this birth record or where was it that they found that immigration. And this was way back before computers. You know, this was in the 1950s, 40s. You know, this was a long time ago. So it's important that we create that kind of paper trail that other people can take up. So I also include my research objective or question. And then I have a huge section, hopefully a huge section, but sometimes not, of known information. So what is it you already know about the research question? So I, I said earlier I was looking for Elmer and Ida May's marriage record. So I do know where they were born. I know the city, the county, the state, the country. Um, I know the years they were born. I know their children's names because they're my great grandparents. So I know that my grandmother was their daughter. So I have lots of things that I know. It's really, once you take the time to log and write out all the things you know, you might be surprised how much you already know. So I do a summary of known information. I'm, I make a list of the repositories or collections that I'm going to start with. Now that list is going to modify and change and evolve over time, but I'm already thinking I need dark county records. I might need help records in the state of Ohio. I might also need some Greenville Cemetery things or maybe go to uh, Greenville and visit the Garst Museum where they have a genealogy room. So those are the kinds of things that I start to list. And then as I think of new records, new collections, well, I haven't checked find a grave and I haven't been on this site or that site. So I'm kind of locate or listing those in the report so I don't forget to check any of those. I list limitations if I know of any. Maybe I'm researching in a burn county in the South, in the United States, or maybe there's just record loss due to the fact that some county or township person took all the records to their house and nobody's seen them since, or, you know, there's lots of different limitations on our records. Um, then we have the summary of findings, itemized findings, and that's really where the real work begins, where I start to list the things that I found and what I learned from them. And I'll show you some examples. Um, I always have a next step section, even if I find the answer to what I'm looking for, I generally try to come up with some next recommendations or next steps. So maybe I found that marriage record I was looking for. Maybe I want to find the birth and marriage records of all of their children. So, you know, I've expanded and I've come up with new things to do research reports. And of course, I keep track of my citations and where I've found things. So what about paper or digital? Lots of choices and decisions here, and it really doesn't matter. I do a little bit of both. So let's talk about that. You know, I do paper sometimes because some archives don't allow computers. Some of them don't allow any technology at all. So I might need a paper pedigree chart with the family listed. I mean, might need some printouts from my family tree maker software or Ancestry Online. I might need some information about what I already know. And of course, I might need to print what I've found so far with my research report. You might have difficulty with technology and maybe you just want to focus on paper and that's okay. So it's what you're doing already that's going to help enhance where you go next. You really can do research reports on paper. You can do them digitally. 
There are some advantages to digital because it's portable, accessible, shareable. So I don't have to lug a lot of things with me to an archive as long as they let me bring in a tablet or laptop or something like that. And I use a tool like OneNote and uh, OneNote and Evernote also are digital notebooks. And so I use that format to help me track things as well, particularly if I'm doing an archive visit. So let's talk for just a moment about what's OneNote because I love this program. It, it was uh, released by Microsoft probably around 2003, and I believe I've been using it almost since the beginning. Um, OneNote is a digital notebook that mimics a regular notebook. So if you think about a binder with sections and papers, and it's a free download, whether you have a Microsoft account or not. Um, there is cloud storage for it, and it's an amazing, amazing tool, and I really love it. Um, it's a structured place for unstructured notes and ideas and information. You can keep all sorts of scraps of paper. It's a way that I really clear the mess off my desk, and it's a searchable place to keep everything. It's a wonderful tool that has so many search features so you can find what you're looking for, and it's a great place to write research reports. This is what it looks like, um, and I know this is kind of like a really quick overview. You can go to hours and hours of classes on OneNote if you want, and plenty of online videos and training on it, um, but this is my notebook in the upper left corner. It's called Mess on the Desk. That's my business company, and so at, below that, you can see there are all these tabs, sort of like dividers in a notebook, and so if I open up the Ohio map, divider, you can see that I have here an Ohio County map. So I have, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and I have about 200 years of Ohio ancestors. And so there, the earliest I'm aware of at this point is 1818. There was an Ohio Welsh immigration. And so some of my ancestors were part of that group. But I need to look at this map all the time, because I need to think about, well, if those those people came to Ohio, those ancestors came down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh, and they landed in Gallia County down there by the bottom of the state. And then they migrated up through Ohio in different routes. You know, I need to look at where are some of the records? Where am I going to find them? Was Gallia County always a county? You know, Ohio, when we were first founded, only had a handful of counties, just five or six. So where would those records be located? So I have lots of things like this, many, many resources in OneNote. So that's just my little plug for that company. So where can you find sample research reports? It's so important for you to look at what's out there and then just make it your own. You don't have to do anything um, just because someone else suggests that's the best way to do it. But BCG, we're going to go through a few of these. The Board for Certification of Genealogists, BCG, has a genealogical um, has genealogical work samples on their website. They have various research reports, case studies, family histories, if you do professional work, client agreements. So lots of great information at BCG about research reports. The Association for Professional Genealogists, or APG for short, has samples on their website from Elizabeth Schoen Mills, who is the author of Evidence Explained. And those reports include some analysis and research plans, which include how strategies, how do you approach the problem, uh, what are you going to do in your analysis, and then research report forms, and how are you going to execute your plan, and then research notes. So how do you track all of your sources and your findings? So sort of like a source, and then you look at the source, and what did you take from that source? So there's lots of different formats at APG, and Elizabeth Schoen Mills has some great ones. Also, I found some really nice ones that you could use at um, Record Click, which is a professional genealogy site, but it gives a great overview of the hows and whys of research projects. And so I thought I would include that here today. And it's a, they, they talk about how a research report is a powerful investigative tool. And they recommend that you choose your format, you define your scope or that research question, 
And then you research that focus question, organizing it, choose your start point, include your sources, your citations, perhaps indexing results, things like that. So they have some really great resources there. And I think the last one I have on the list, um, Family Tree Magazine has a blog post that I love from Lisa Alzo. And um, she talks about um, listing the objective. And for us, um, I've also talked about that as a research report um, question, um, listing the facts, the known ancestor facts, form a working hypothesis. So what is it that you think you know? What do you think the answer is? Identify sources and then implement research strategies. So she has a great example online of that as well. Don't be afraid to make it your own because there are five Fs that can spell failure. The first one is forgetting your own style and workflow. I don't know about you, but if I watch a webinar or attend a session on organization and someone presents this wonderful way to organize everything and it's very cumbersome and there's lots of steps and lots of detail, pretty soon I've decided it's not making me more efficient. It's just giving me more to do. And so if you have a particular style and workflow, try to find something that matches that really well. Don't don't try to do something completely different that's just not really your style. Don't necessarily focus on famous genealogists and how they do it. Um, I did give you some examples there, but make it your own. Uh, there's no right way or wrong way to do this. Sometimes people think they have to be super formal in a research report. It makes them, it draws them back to like grade 11 English class and writing research reports. It doesn't have to be formal. You can make it functional. For me, I call it a stream of consciousness. What did I look at? What did I learn? What did I look at? What did I learn? So it's that kind of a stream of consciousness. Fancy footnotes. Oh boy, do people get really tripped up over footnotes and sources and citations. And you really can get tripped up in that. But don't let that be your downfall. If you know where you found something, the location, the author, you know, it doesn't matter if it's fancy or not. If someone else can follow it and find what you found, good enough. And failing to start. That's always the biggest uh, of the Fs that can spell failure is failing to start. You really want to dis decide from here on, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to start with this one research question and I'm going to try it. And that's going to be your key to success. So what's your goal? Research reports can help you keep on task. Some of us get a little excited and go down rabbit trails and trace things. And we just have kind of this shotgun approach to research, not really focused. So the research report can really keep you on task. It doesn't mean that you give up all of your fun searching. Of course not. You're still going to do that. But it's kind of with a purpose and so that you're not repeating yourself. It also helps you start and stop a project so you can remember where you left off. You can communicate with others by emailing or sharing or using a shared document online. You can publish. So once you finish your report, you can actually publish that report. Maybe you want to donate that to the local society where your ancestors lived. Maybe someone else might be interested in following your lead and continuing on. Think about how excited we would be if we go to an archive and we find a vertical file and there's a folder that says the Calderwood family. And in that is something I wrote and it's going to help someone else. Of course, we're excited for any piece of paper we find, right? So for me, it's a lot less formal. It's a stream of consciousness. Now at my job, I work with formal research reports. But in my personal genealogy, I'm doing more of a stream of consciousness. What did I find? What did I learn? That's kind of the way I do it. So let's talk a little bit about DNA research reports because there are some nuances there. So what kind of documents can go into a DNA report? 
basically anything else that allows someone to follow what you did. <laughs> so if you're looking at autosomal DNA, perhaps you have ancestry kit, and my heritage kit, and living DNA kit, and you're looking at all those things and you're looking at match lists. So you, you want to think about all the evidence collection. So what did you do and what did you find? And then the other part of that science process is can someone else replicate what you did? Can they read what you wrote and figure out you looked at this match and oh, they had a tree. Oh, and that tree led you to this ancestral couple. Oh, there's a common surname. I need to check that out. So can someone else follow what you're doing? Doesn't have to be formal, but can they follow it? So what kind of documents can go in your research report, whether it's DNA or otherwise? We're going to talk specifically about DNA, but Excel files. We all have match lists, um, some of which we can download from the testing companies. Um, we might have Y-DNA match lists or mitochondrial. We might use GEDmatch. Maybe we have reports from the tools. So if you do uh, use a tool at one of the companies and you right click and print, at least on a PC, right click and print, you could choose to save it as a PDF. Maybe that's something that you want to add to your report or make an appendix. Also, if I find GEDCOMs from GEDmatch or screenshots from, from any of the family history, family tree programs, I use those as well. So lots of different things can go in your report. And I'll show you some samples of those. So the flow of the report, I just used an example of an unknown paternal grandfather. So if my research question is around who is the grandfather of a tester or who is the father of this particular man, which would be a paternal grandfather to the tester. So you start with what you know and you summarize what's known about that person, that target of research. So if you don't know the paternal grandfather, you do know the person where you're looking for their father. And so you can write up what you know about them. You might include ethnicity if that's useful. Um, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's just, you know, a lot of Eastern Europe or, or something like that in our databases that are predominantly European. Sometimes ethnicity isn't as valuable. Remember, those are estimates. So those are going to be hints. Um, you want to sort your matches, so you might have sort match lists, you might use a program for that, um, but you want to filter by the maternal matches that aren't relevant, and then the paternal maternal matches, that grandmother that are not relevant, and then focus on the paternal paternal matches. I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. Sometimes that's a little easier to understand if you have a visual to look at. So is Y-DNA or mitochondrial DNA useful? What about the hypothesized relationships? What do we know about the family? What do we know about the matches? What can we assume or guess about the mass matches? And then focus on one hypothesis at a time. So there's a lot I've listed here, but what you want to do is think about all the different things you're going to do when you're analyzing DNA. And of course, I didn't even mention, but we're not going to do that in a DNA vacuum. We're going to include all kinds of other resources. We're going to look at the censuses, the city directories. We may even, if we're looking for a, a grandfather, we might even be looking in Ben Verified or one of the other people searching tools for living people. So there are many different things we're going to consider in our research report. These are just a sample of what I would start with, and it probably would double from that by the time I get finished. So let's look at some sample pieces of the things that you might want to include in your report. So remember, mine is a stream of consciousness. What do I look at? What did I find? And what did I learn? So there's power in visuals, diagrams, art, tree excerpts. So any of those things that can enhance your report, that can give you a snapshot or give you a summary of information without a long narrative, you want to do that. So if you have, if you're tracing someone through the census, let's just use an example of that, and you have maybe four different censuses or five different censuses. And you started with the 1950 and then the 1940 and you're working way, your way back. 
you can write that out as a narrative as a paragraph about each census and who was in the household and what were their ages and what were their you know occupations you can write that out the other thing you can do is make a table that has the family members and what ages were they in 1950 and what were the occupations and where did they live? And that same information for 1940 and 1930. A table is so much more representative of the group of data than just writing out a narrative. And sometimes we lose something when we're just typing it out and -and so-and-so was nine and -and so-and-so was eight. And then there were twins who were seven. And then pretty soon we're just kind of lost in that narrative. So sometimes if we can make something into a diagram, we should. So let me give you some examples of the things that I do as diagrams. So this is uh, something that I do quite often for DNA analysis. Um, This has to do with my first to second cousin category. And if you watch my other webinar that I did for Roots Tech on DNA misconceptions, you'll see this case where I talk about it in a slightly different way. But in terms of our research report, I'm looking at all of those uh, seven first to second cousins that Ancestry has identified as a first to second cousin category. Now, the reason I say category is because, of course, those people can each have a different relationship to me. They don't have to be a first cousin and they don't have to be a second cousin. So what I'll often do with a category of matches is I'll write down their names. I've done anonymizing here, but I I write down their names. They're shared centimorgans with me. And then what ancestry categorizes them as, which is first to second cousin. And then what's the actual relationship once I figure it out? So in my seven first to second cousin category, I don't have any first cousins and I don't have any second cousins. What I have are five half first cousins and I have two full first cousins twice removed. And that's who's in my first to second cousin category. So if you're not familiar with the match lists at the testing companies, those default categories cover a wide range of relationships. And so if you want to figure out what those relationships are, probably your first stop is the shared Santa Morgan project at DNA Painter, where you can put in those Santa Morgan amounts and you can actually look at what are the possible relationships for 853 Santa Morgans or 406 Santa Morgans. So that's the kind of analysis that I do. And I would put this in a research report. I would have the table, I would have the side by side showing the information shown on screen, and then the information that I found. The other thing this allows you to do is quickly look to see the last time I looked at Ancestry, I had seven first to second cousin category, but today I have nine people in that list. So now I need to add two more people to my list so I can quickly gauge that I've got new people I need to analyze. So it's really helpful not only to whoever may read your research report or you as a researcher, but it's going to be really helpful too as new matches come in. Remember, DNA is kind of ever evolving. We have changing match lists by the day sometimes. So I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about sorting and show you a visual. So this is for that unknown biopaternal grandfather. So I have him on the far left represented in green. And so we've got a tester and the tester has mom and dad. And then the mother has two parents and the father has two parents. But that unknown bio father is the one we're looking for. That pat pat ancestor, the paternal paternal, that's who we're looking for. So when you're sorting your match list, what you want to do is you want to take out all of the matches that are maternal because they're not relevant to your research question. The Reeds and the Calderwoods don't matter to this unknown grandfather. They're not connected. Then you want to take out the father's mother's line, the Kennedys, because they're not related to the question either. And so then what you're left with in your match list are those that can help you answer the question of who is that unknown paternal grandfather. So if you want to filter to remove mom's matches, so that takes out the reeds and the Calderwoods, and then you want to filter to remove father's mother, and we get the second group, 
And then we want to see what remains. And that gives us our, our group that are all related to that paternal grandfather. So these are the kind of things that I include in a research report, screenshots showing the relationships. If you're familiar with the leads method and you want to sort a match list using that leads method and sort into ancestral clusters or, or genetic networks, um, that's something you're going to definitely want to include in your research report. And so I do um, this on spreadsheets. And so it just ends up being one more thing in my researcher folder or maybe eventually an attachment or an appendix at the end. And so this is something that I do with every DNA question is I sort my matches to see if I can identify those grandparent or great grandparent lines. And then I start researching those clusters or groups in earnest. Um, for more information about how to use the leads method, Dana Leeds has a website and she does a lot of public speaking and many of us do um, presentations on how to do her method as well. Some of you might be familiar with the clustering tools that are at some of the testing companies. MyHeritage has clustering tool. Uh, GEDmatch has a clustering tool. There also are third-party clustering tools like uh, Genetic Affairs, uh, DNAGEDCOM.com. There are a number of different ones that are third-party tools. And so the clustering screenshots can be really helpful to keep you on track. So maybe your research question is, I want to identify the, and study my mom's red cluster of matches. So the people are all in that red box, those 11 people. I want to study and see if I can figure out how all of them are related to each other and then how they're related to me. So I'm going to use this cluster of red folks and I'm going to do some analysis on them. And the visuals can be really compelling to your story. It can help prompt your memory where you were. And the visuals can also capture that real-time data. So let me show you how I might analyze using that. So if I look at that red cluster, I can look at the, those matches also in my heritage in the chromosome browser. Now you can only input seven people at a time. So I picked the first seven people in that cluster and I compared them to my mom and they all have a triangulated segment that you can see kind of outlined in that gray square. And so you can see that all this cluster, if I were able to put all 11 people in, would all have that triangulated cluster probably, depending on how closely they're related to me. So this is the kind of thing that I would include in a report. And of course, I would use the names of the people or the, or the usernames of the people. I've just kind of anonymized and simplified so that I can show it on screen. This is kind of the chart that I make. So let me just walk you through this. These are the 11 matches that were in my mom's red cluster. So the first column, and if you think about this kind of like a spreadsheet or, or a graphic or a table, the first column is the match name. So Janet, Diane, Norma, those are all DNA matches in this cluster. And then the second column is their self-reported age. And you notice there are some blanks. So there are people who don't report their age. Um, but sometimes that can give us clues if they're possibly the same generation as my mom. So my mom is in her 80s. So maybe Norma in her 80s is the same generation as my mom. And maybe Billy in his 40s is a generation younger or maybe two generations younger, just depending on the family structure. I also include a column for how the testing company has defined the relationship. So this is how my heritage has defined the relationship. That is really important when you're determining how far back is the match. And so it's important to look at the range of relationships that they're reporting. The next column, sometimes there's just one number here for Senna Morgans, but I included how much uh, Janet matches my mom and also me. Uh, because I have my the results there as well. So I, I was curious about that. So Janet shares 40 centimorgans with my mom and 37 with me. Diane shares 46 with my mom and 35 with me. So I just wanted to see side by side what the comparison is. Um, it's 
typical that I would share less DNA uh, with a match than my mom does, unless there's kind of a blip in the reading, because I don't inherit anything that my mom doesn't already have. But um, I just do that side by side comparison. I just find that interesting. And then my last section is just trying to glean a little bit from any trees or any information that they have posted. So Janet had a tree that had her grandparents. So I use G there. Her grandparents were Simon, Nichols, and Harris. She only had three grandparents listed, one unknown. So I don't know which one of those lines I'm related to or my mom is. Um, also, Diane, she had four grandparents listed. Then I got to Norma and Norma had a pretty big tree and she had her third great grandparents listed. So I listed all those surnames and some of the other ones associated um, in earlier generation or closer generations. So I have a list of surnames that I'm kind of gathering information. And then if they don't have a tree, I note that. And if the, they only have themselves in a tree, I note that, or they only have their parents. So I'm just tracking what kind of information do they have? And so sometimes you'll start to see a pattern perhaps in the surnames, sometimes not. There's really not a pattern in the surnames here. So I don't know how all 11 of these people are related to my mom. So I've got work to do, but this is kind of how I, I, I source the information. I extract what I learned from using that those 11 people in that cluster and looking at each one of them. So tables, you know, there's no need for a long narrative if you have a graphic. I use the example of the census, but here's another example. If you have information about um, a tree, let's say, and you've got someone who's um, a DNA match, and then you found a family tree associated. Then you can write up in your findings, what did I find? So this is sort of what I was talking about when I said, where, where did you find something and what did you find? So what did I find and what did I learn? So these are the columns that I'm talking about in the research report. And I just use a table format for this, but you can do whatever you want to do. But I do the source. So who's the match and how are they related? And then I look at if they have a tree and what's the URL of that tree so I can go back to it later. And so I write a, a couple sentences. It's very brief, but I'm looking at the public tree that has maybe an ancestor's name, the Kennedy name I recognize. And then I look at shared matches and how close are those shared matches. So those are the kinds of things that I'm noting when I'm going to a match and then what did I learn? And then another match and what did I learn? And you'll start to recognize patterns. Our brains are really, really keyed in to recognizing those patterns, but it's hard for us to keep all that data in our head. And so this a research report's a perfect format for it. Now, Lucidchart is a, is a product that I use. Um, there's a free side and a pay side for this, but I make all kinds of little family trees and diagrams to help me when I'm analyzing not only DNA, but traditional projects. And I'm looking at all sorts of information, but I want to look at kind of the general family structure. So this is a research report about the Kennedys, where on the far left, you can see there's one of the Kennedys that I have as a DNA match. And so I've added in his siblings, his parents, the common grandparent that's shared between his mother and my father. And so you can see how it goes back to that common set of great grandparents. And so we've got a lot of kits that are in our, our family cluster, so to speak. So this is my kit, my siblings, my first cousins, my half first cousins, and so on. So these are, my children are in here as well. So this is just what I do when I'm starting to piece together a family. There are a number of reasons to do this, but the number one reason for me is so that when I look at this, I can see if the amount of centimorgans are appropriate for the relationships and the generations. So when I look on the far left with the Kennedy match, and I look at his two sisters next to him, you know, are 2652 and 2553 appropriate for sibling relationships? Are they full siblings or half? Those kinds of things. And then when I look at my children's shared centimorgans with that cousin, I'm looking at 312, 320, 345. Is that really appropriate for a 
for a first cousin once removed or a half first cousin once removed. So those are the kinds of things that I'm analyzing while I'm just putting together this Lucid chart. And Lucid chart is so easy to use. It's like a drag and drop thing. So you drag a shape, you type in it, you drag another shape, you type in it. You can do the connections super quick. So I use this all the time. You can make other diagrams of possible relationships. So this is one where I was looking for my father's unknown father. Um, I had a, a new grandpa situation and I had some DNA matches and I was trying to figure out if this woman who was a DNA match to me was an aunt or half aunt, whether she was a half sibling to my dad or whether she was a niece or half niece. So I'm trying to re reconcile that information. Sometimes it helps me to make a diagram or a picture so that I don't forget what are all the five relationships I'm looking at. I want to know if she's aunt, half aunt, half sibling, niece, or half niece. That way it keeps me on track. I can check that one off. I can check that one off. Nope, it's not that one. So this is a way that I keep track of relationships sometimes. And this is a really rough diagram, just using some clip art from the internet. If you have ethnicity results, I don't spend a lot of time on ethnicity estimates, but what I do with them is I retype them from the company websites. There's something about keying it in or writing it down that really kind of cements it in my mind. So I'm, I'm really a kinesthetic kind of learner. I want to write it or I want to, uh, I want to type it. And so I look at the ethnicity composition and I'm typing that out. It just cements it in my mind a little bit more. And then I look at those DNA communities that ancestry gives us and I type those out as well. And I recognize some right away. We have connections to um, Ohio. If you look down at the very bottom, you see Dark County, Ohio there. That's our common grandmother that we have from Dark County, Ohio. So typing those things out sometimes will really cement those in your mind. I do screenshots of family trees. A number of reasons for this. First of all, I screenshot the piece of my tree that I'm working on, but I also screenshot other people's trees. Number one reason is because you never know if it's going to be there next time you go back. And so I will screenshot what I find of a match. So if I have a match I'm looking at, I look at the Centimorgan values and I figure out, well, maybe they're a second to third cousin. So maybe I need to look at the third great grandparent level or the fourth great grandparent level. So how far out can I screen grab their tree that, to help me? So those are the kinds of things that I actually copy and paste right into my research report, my stream of consciousness. What did I look at? Sometimes I use it to hypothesize relationships. So let me show you one thing when I'm looking for unknown, we'll go back to that unknown grandfather. I'm looking for an unknown grandfather and we have a match that shows up at Ancestry and that match happens to have a tree and it has all these people in it. Now, of course, it's someone else's tree and just like our tree, um, probably not the best uh, scenario to say that our tree is probably wrong. Most of you might get upset by that, but a lot of our trees are wrong and we find that out with DNA analysis, but we're going to assume that this guy's on top of it and he's got a pretty good tree. So what I've identified here are the men who could possibly be maybe the unknown grandfather I'm looking for. So I start to write the hypotheses. So I'm figuring here that the DNA match is possibly the grandson of William and the great grandson of George. So those first two red boxes. Maybe this match is the grant and the DNA match that I'm looking at. My cousin is the grandson of John and the great grandson of Janice. Could be. Uh, maybe he's the grandson of an unknown son of Michael. So we always have to consider those unknowns because not everyone who had a child has that child identified in the trees, right? We know there are out of wedlock births and, and misattributed parentage and adoptions and other things like that. So I've got three possible hypotheses. And what I do is I write those down. So that's, you know, that's just one way that I do it to help me. I also screenshot maps. 
I love maps. I don't know about you, but when I'm working on a project or maybe a Y DNA project, this is one from a cousin where I'm looking at this match who is an exact match at 37 markers. And his name is Pavel from Czechoslovakia. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at this project, this family tree DNA project for a specific county in what's known now as Slovakia. And how far is Roznova from Spies, which is where the two DNA or Y DNA matches are from. So I use maps a lot. I do screen grabs of maps and that helps me kind of visualize in my research. Write it all down. So number one thing about a research report is if you see it, if you look at it, you write it. So the known information, the sources, the citations, whatever you've extracted or transcribed out of the information, your hypotheses or your guesses, write them down. Write down your conclusions or your temporary conclusions. Write down your recommendations or where you wanna go next, next steps. So how do I organize all this stuff? I will tell you, I have some file naming conventions that I use. I do a lot of different file types. Um, and this is just an example. I use underscore a lot just visually. It helps me see. Um, I'll use maybe the testing company, the tool that I use and who I compared. And of course, in real life, I'm adding full names there so that I can remember who everyone is. Um, and also I will do the kit number or my Kelly B ancestry matches or my 23andMe matches. So I have lots of different file names. But remember, your file naming doesn't have to be perfect because your computer is fully searchable. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the folder. So I have a folder for each project. And this is in my uh, in my computer. I have a folder for each project that I'm working on. Um, this is one that I've redacted as many names as I thought I needed to. But I start with a zero, zero start here. <laughs> the reason why I do zero, zero start here is so that it's always at the top of the folder. And so that's where my research report is. And that Word document is my stream of consciousness. I'm just writing and archiving and screen grabbing and pasting and everything's going in there. Then I have a section numbered maybe by their appearance in the, in the sequence of what I'm looking at and the sequence of discussion. And then of course I have lots of other files particularly with DNA analysis, or you might have lots and lots of documents. Maybe you have something you downloaded from newspapers.com or a census record or a birth record you sent for and you've scanned. So lots of, it's a great way to keep lots of things together in one place. So we're going to take some questions from the group. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it back over to the moderator. And they're going to, to probably give me some of the questions that you have. We won't get to everything, but let's try doing some of those now. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Sure. All right. So first, uh, first question we have is, my mom left me 45 years of printed family group sheets, pedigree charts, and copies of documents. Takes up an entire closet. I don't know how much of the paper copies to keep and how much to rely on being safe and saved in family search, ancestry, and other programs. Any insight? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I there are some things that I save and some things that I don't. Um, you know, and that's a personal decision, and that depends on you know, a lot of your personal family history and what age you are and are there living people in the documents, things like that. So there's lots of things to consider. But what I've been doing lately, I'm in my 50s and my late 50s, almost 60. And I keep thinking, I want to preserve things for the future. So what I do with things like that is I scan them. Not only have I put input the information into my software program, but I scan those so that I have a copy of the original. And then I take the originals and actually donate them. So I donate them to the local area where that particular family lived, or you can donate all of them to one location. 
So for me in Ohio, most of my ancestors are in about five counties in Ohio for a couple hundred years. So that's that's what I do is I scan them so that I have them, but then I donate so that they're not in the closet where no one else can use them. All right, great. Uh, we have a few more here. Uh, I mean, I feel like you kind of just touched on this, but just in case there's anything else you want to add, they say, please, suggestions for a coherent system for naming my crazy folders. <laughs> so digital folders or or folder folders, real paper folders. Um, when you're talking about digital, I generally do the name of the person and then what's in it. Um, or I do research report or research question and then have everything in the folder. Um, paper folders are a little more difficult because you have, you know, surnames and women's surnames that change over time with marriage and remarriage. So, um, but digitally for folders, I generally keep it very simple because my computer is so searchable. Um, I don't have to have a lot of subfolder structure. And also the other thing I do in complement with that is I attach things to my family tree software. So I use family tree maker. And it, it synchronizes with Ancestry, but I use that and I attach photos, documents, census, files. So most of my collection is digital and most of my collection is attached to a particular ancestor or more than one ancestor. So that's the way that I happen to use that software. It really makes it more, you know, three-dimensional and it just helps me track. What do I know about this particular person at any given point in time? So I hope that helps. All right, next up we have, what is the difference between a research log versus a research report? Well, it depends. So a research log really is kind of what I was showing you that side by side. You know, what did I find? What did I learn? or source and results or analysis. You know, if you're gonna make a side-by-side -side table, that's more of a research log. A research report really could be a summary of all your known information and what you've learned at the end of it that could be a little more formal. But for me, I do both. I'm doing little mini summaries. So when I look at a group of DNA matches, let's say as an example, and they're all those 11 matches that match my mom in that red group, then at the bottom of analyzing those 11 matches and what I found, I'll do a little mini summary there. So it's sort of like a little mini research report within the research log. Now, other people do more formal things. And I gave you some examples at the beginning where you could look at some of the other ways that people do that. All right. Next up, we have, can you recommend sources to learn about genealogy DNA? There are some great books out there to learn about DNA. I would say the top two for me, um, one would be Blaine Bettinger. He's written a book on DNA and how to learn your um, family through DNA. I, I should know the, I should know the, the title off the top of my head, but I can't think of it. Um, but look up Blaine Bettinger. Um, he's written two books. There's one that's a revised version. So get the newest one. You can find it every library I've ever been to. I've found that book. So that's a great one to start with. It talks about all the different testing companies, what the ethnicity report means, what the matches look like. He's also the founder of the Shared Santa Morgan Project that I talked about earlier today at DNA Painter. And so you might learn a little bit more about some of those tools and, and analytical things. Um, the second book that I'd recommend for beginners um, is Diane Southard's book. Um, she wrote a book in 2020, I believe, um, about your DNA guide. And that's the company that she runs. And she's got a book as well. So she sells that, I believe, off her website, also Amazon. Amazon. And so, so those are two that I recommend for beginning DNA analysis. All right. So next up we have, how do you get the correspondence organized with your various DNA matches from different companies? Um, I have a spreadsheet where I do, I, I mentioned that I, I do leads charts. And so when I do my listed ancestry and I do a leads chart, I will add a tab and I will do my list at my heritage and also do a leads chart. And then I will add a tab and do 23andMe 
my match list and do a leads chart. And then if I'm really ambitious, I will combine all those tabs into one big giant spreadsheet. But normally I don't get that far because I'm starting to find some answers and I don't necessarily need to combine them. But one thing that's helpful about that is if you look at the tab that has ancestry and maybe someone has a tree and then you look at their results at MyHeritage and they don't have a tree, but you can look at the chromosome browser or the clustering tools at MyHeritage. So you can kind of crowdsource what's available at Ancestry for that particular match and what they also offer at MyHeritage for that particular match. But again, seeing that list of matches in a spreadsheet or on paper is going to really help you notice that pattern of names. So that's that's what I do to track those. And it's one giant spreadsheet per kit. So if it's my kit, it's my ancestry matches, my 23andMe, my living DNA, and so on in each tab. That's how I track it. All right, next we have, what about screenshots of trees and the likelihood of it being full of errors or not, of course? So do you use it to gather information to further research for accuracy? Is that what you were saying? Yes. So when I screen capture the trees that might be associated with DNA kits or the trees that are associated, maybe I was looking online and I found four or five trees that mention a particular ancestor. I will screen grab those trees and just start to do some beginning analysis. What I've learned is with DNA matches in particular, sometimes people delete their kits, they delete their trees you know, and I go back to look for it and it's not there. So I'm just kind of in the habit of screen grab and pasting it into my research report. And then I can just look at it later. I'm not using them as if they're 100% accurate. I'm using them in combination with through lines. I'm using them in combination with the clustering and the networks that I find through leads. And I'm just trying to kind of piece it all together, those puzzle pieces. But I do capture them in case they disappear. Uh, all right. And then we have, we have just a few more now. Okay. Uh, okay. So this person was saying their, um, their tech challenge, how can I okay. easily compile some research without knowing how to do all these tables, et cetera? Is there someone that could help me set up some of these, these tools like leads chart and cluster tables, et cetera? Well, probably the best resource for learning how to do some of those tools, of course, is the internet. Um, there are all kinds of YouTube videos and things like that. Also, um, I love Legacy Family Tree webinars. Um, I think their membership, their yearly membership is $49, but they have an Im immense amount of technology topics, DNA topics, a wonderful resource for really a pretty small fee for, for the year. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is maybe you don't try the technology route yet. You start with paper. So here's what I do. I use loose leaf paper. I don't use a notebook because I like to be able to rearrange it. So if I'm analyzing DNA matches, I might write down five different matches and I might number them one, two, three, four, five. And then with each piece of paper that follows, I might, here's my analysis for match number one. Here's match number two. Here's match number three. Or if you're looking at um, traditional research and you're researching maybe a set of siblings. So you've got this marital couple and in the census, you're finding these five siblings that are all descendants of that couple. So sibling number one has a paper and sibling number two has a paper, you know, and then as you start to find records and other things, you can insert those papers in the right place. Um, so eventually you have that kind of that running stream of consciousness that makes sense. Um, but that's what I, what I typically do. And with DNA analysis, I do a lot on paper. I sketch out trees on paper. You know, I'm, I'm kind of doing that as I go. Great. Um, what genealogy program do you use or recommend? Um, well, it depends. For family tree information, I use Family Tree Maker software. Um, and you can order that online. Um, it's a company called McKeev. And I use that. There are lots of other alternatives to that, but that's the one I use. I synchronize with Ancestry. Um, also, if I sign in to Ancestry and sign in to Family Search, 
then hints appear for both Ancestry and Family Search. So that's really helpful. Um, if you're talking about what kinds of other tools that I might use for DNA analysis, I use DNA Painter. Um, and I also use a lot of the clustering tools and other chromosome browsers that are at the testing sites. It can get really expensive really fast. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next, we have besides saving to your computer, are you saving your research elsewhere, cloud, external drive, USB? Other? Of course, yes. Preservation is really important and backing things up is super important. So I have um, I have a program that I use that's called Sync, you know, S-Y-N-C, and it's a monthly subscription. And whatever I put in this folder, it is kept in cloud storage at Sync. So I use that. I also use external hard drives, the kinds that you can plug in and drag things over and, and preserve, but I don't use the kind that you keep on the desk um, plugged in all the time, only because I live in Ohio and we have fires and floods and tornadoes and all kinds of things. And so if, some, if a fire takes out my house and my computer, I don't want it to take out my external hard drive as well. So I have a number of different things and I also use cloud backup. So I connect my family's tree maker software synchronized to Ancestry. So that's a cloud backup. I use Google. So I have Google Drive. That's a cloud backup. And I also use OneNote that has its own Microsoft cloud or, or OneDrive um, cloud backup. So I, I use a number of different systems to kind of make sure that I'm not losing anything at any given time. All right, and then we have, is there any software that generates a research report that is helpful? Not that I have used or seen. That's a great question. There, there might be. And of course, with all the um, AI stuff that's happening now, uh, there might soon be a way to take that running stream of consciousness and build a report out of it. Um, but I have not used anything or seen anything yet. Okay, and then this is the last one. Okay. Have you used Goldie May and do you find it useful? I have not. All right, then that is it. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining this session of Roots Tech 2023. I hope you learned something today. There are plenty of more streaming and, uh, and or archived sessions to attend this week. So don't forget to do that while you've got time. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Kelly. And as a reminder, the session was recorded. So if you missed anything or want to go back and see anything, you'll be able to